In the theory of relativity for deriving the length contraction expression, we use Lorentz transformation equation. While for deriving the time dilation expression, we use inverse Lorentz transformation equation. Why? Uh, let's start by putting some equations to those words. Irrelevant derived expressions are given above in context. In context. So the length contraction expression is delta x prime equals 1 divided by gamma times delta x, where gamma is 1 divided by the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. And that number is also happens to be greater than or equal to 1. It gets bigger as v increases. So the length contraction is divided by a number greater than 1, whereas the time dilation is multiplied by a number greater than 1. So here you can see that the time dilation does end up multiplying by the Lorentz factor. And the length contraction ends up multiplying by the inverse Lorentz factor, uh, or reciprocal. So it's very interesting very curious that these things end up doing this the opposite to space and time. However, I don't think we should confuse the Lorentz contraction factor with the Lorentz transformation equations. I went and googled Lorentz transformation equations, and I found at Hyperphysics that they have the e these equations for the Lorentz transformation equations. Now to achieve a bit more symmetry in these equations, I'm going to multiply the equation regarding uh, t prime by the speed of light c. So I'm going to multiply this by c, this by c, and then that c there is going to cancel out. So it'll be c t prime equals c t. And then I'm going, to, I'm going to define a new variable called beta, which is going to be v over c. So this is going to be c t minus beta x over square root of 1 minus beta squared. And this one is going to be, um, OK, what I'm going to do is solve this for v. v equals beta c. And then I'll plug that beta c in here. So I'll have x minus beta c t over square root of 1 minus beta squared. And all of that is going to be equal to x prime. OK, why did I do this? Well, now I can take these two equations and kind of form something called a matrix, x prime. I'll go ahead and put the y prime and z, z prime in here, too. But all of this is going to be multiplied by some matrix times x, y, z, and t. And you may not, you might need to review uh, matrix multiplication to see why I'm doing this. But this line will be the second line in the uh, the matrix, and it represents y prime equals zero times x plus one times y plus zero times z plus zero times t. This line is going to be 0, 0, 1, 0, and say z prime equals 0 times x plus 0 times y plus 1 times z plus 0 times t. So it's just saying z prime equals z. The first line is going to say uh, gamma and times x plus 0 times y plus 0 times z plus plus gamma minus gamma beta times ct. And I forgot to put in the ct there. Gamma times beta times ct in that last line. And it's a negative sign. Then um, this line is going to have negative beta, negative beta gamma x, negative beta gamma x plus 0y plus 0z plus 1 times ct. No, gamma, sorry. Eight. Very helpful. Not. OK. So this is kind of mysterious, right? Um, this, now that I've put it this way, it looks 
exactly symmetrical. X prime gamma, negative beta gamma, and negative beta gamma gamma. So it does seem this strange that this uh, equation, this Lorentz transformation equation, does different things to space and time. Well, that's because it doesn't do different things to space and time. It does the same thing. I'm going to take a second to just compare this to what uh, an ordinary rotation looks like. If I take an object or take a, a matrix and rotate it counterclockwise around an angle of, say, theta, if I take all of the points in the object and just kind of rotate them around, so I've got something that looks like this, a smiley face, and I rotate it around, say, 90 degrees, it'll look like that, right? Um, the equation for that is uh, y, is it x or x or y? I'm not sure. Let me uh, just write this down. I this is essentially what um, your rotation matrix will look like. You'll multiply, once you know what your angle is, you'll take x is going to become cosine theta times x minus sine theta times y and y prime becomes sine theta times x plus cosine theta times y. Um, now if I want to, I can actually write ct prime and x prime very similarly. It actually turns out that it's the hyperbolic co hyperbolic cosh, okay. and it has to do with the hyperbolic cos cosine of theta, which is gamma, and the hyperbolic sine of theta is beta gamma. And by the way, the hyperbolic tangent of theta is sinh over cosh, just like the regular tangent is sine over cosine, is beta. So um, actually what we're doing here, uh, the actual Lorentz transformation equation, is a hyperbolic rotation. Now in an ordinary rotation, it is kind of controlled by the equation x squared plus y squared equals r squared. Oops. Equals r squared. And uh, what happens then is you pick out your radius and you rotate around that radius and it stays within that radius. Um, with a hyperbolic rotation, your uh, limiting factor is x squared minus y squared equals r squared, or x squared, or y squared minus x squared equals r squared. The uh, x squared minus r y squared equals r squared gives you um, a situation where the x value is greater than the y value, and you'll have curves over here that go like this, and curves over here that go like this. Um, the y squared minus x squared is where the y is greater than the x, and you'll have curves up here that go like this, and curves down here that go like this. The uh, net effect, I'm going to bring up the Anima an animation of this rotation going on looks something like this, so that the uh, the points kind of follow along and they either climb up if y is greater than x, or the absolute value of y is greater than x, or they come down this way and curve down and around if the absolute value of x is greater than the absolute value of y. Um, now, if I can point to where time dilation and length contraction is occurring in this animation, maybe it will be possible to convey an understanding of why time dilation lengthens the time between events, while Lorentz contraction shortens the length of an object. In order to do that, I'll just take a screen capture from the animation so we can mark up the diagram a little bit. Uh, you can see here that the distance between these red dots is pretty small. Uh, when the line was vertical, they were exactly like one second apart. So here marked one, two, three, four, five. You can see they're a little bit further apart here. This one goes a little bit past two. This one's a little bit further past three. This one's a little bit further past four. 
um, when they get out to here, check this out. This guy is almost double the amount of time it took. This one goes out to almost four, and you don't even have the third second on the map for the purple guy. Same thing with the yellow. Um, this is about one second. This is about, or one and a half seconds. This is about three seconds. This and this one. It's, uh, well, it's anyway, they're more than one second each. So that's kind of the expected behavior of time dilation. Um, but time goes time goes slower for the fast moving bodies. But what about length dilation? We find the exact same thing happens for these events um, on the x coordinate. We've got this guy pretty what close to one light second. This guy at two. This guy at three. This guy at four. And then if you have the object going faster, this this is almost one and a half, three, four already, two and a half, four. Um, these guys are even more uh, stretched out. So it looks like time, it looks like space is stretched out just as much as time is. However, that's just it. We're uh, looking at the time or the space between events that may be attached to an object, but we're not looking at the object itself. These events down here are showing events that happened to the object previously in the past. And these events up here are events that are going to happen to the object in the future. But they don't convey the coordinates of the object where it is now. Okay, in order to consider where the object technically is now, and I'm going to use some big words here, uh, we have to look at where the world lines of the object, and I'm going to draw those world lines. We're going to uh, see where the world lines of the object. Here's a couple of world lines. Um, tells you where the object is, has been and where it's going where it has been and where it's going. And in particular, we're going to look at where the world lines of the object intersect with the line of simultaneity. This is the line of simultaneity, and it represents our concept of what is now. And it's really kind of a, maybe not an accurate premise to really think of the world as uh, as what it is now because, you know, because there's a whole region of events in here that we could call now. Everywhere over here is basically now and, and everywhere over here is basically now. Um, all of those events can be moved along that, um, along these hyperbolic curves. Anything that's within those um, y squared, x squared minus y squared equals r squared region where x is greater than y. Those are all technically in the region called now. But um, there is a concept besides now of simultaneity. And that is this line straight down the middle. The length between here and here is contracting as we get faster. And you can see that if you look at, say, some of the yellow lines, as a matter of, or let's look at these orange lines. Uh, we'll take this orange line and this orange line and see that this is not, let's see, I think it's getting a little bit more contracted than this one. But you can especially see it with those purple lines. This idea of simultaneity. There's a lot of confusion comes about in relativity because some people are aware that, um, that this idea of simultaneity is a false concept. Um, that, for instance, there is one observer that will view that this uh, event is simultaneous with this event. 
but there is another observer that will say this event is simultaneous with this event. And still another observer that will say this event is simultaneous with this event. Um, but um, they sometimes make the mistake of stressing that the simultaneity is a false concept. They convey that it is poorly defined. It's not a poorly defined concept. If you are traveling along this uh, vector, then you would view this and this events to be simultaneous, simultaneous and these and your lines of simultaneity would be uh, parallel with that. And same thing if you uh, were on, if you were traveling along, say, can't even draw it very well, this vector, then you would view this event and this event as being simultaneous. Now we can see that those events are a long ways away a ways in space and time, but when we look at where they cro where they cross those world lines associated with them cross here, you see that they are uh, contracted a lot. And I'm saying we can see that they're contracted a lot on the space-time diagram. Um, but, of course, if you actually viewed the scenario in real life, it might there might be uh, a lot of other optical effects going on, and what you would see might be quite what quite different from the actual coordinates of the event, the simple coordinates of the events themselves. But anyway, as an as an analogy of why I would say this might be a false concept. Um, we could do the same thing with the time variable and say this is the line, whereas this was the line of simultaneity, we can say that this is the line of here-ness. Um, so this is, this is here. Um, and then ask, where does this guy's line of now-ness cross with our line of here-ness? Or instead of asking where this guy's line of here-ness crosses with our now-ness. And then we could get, oh, well, actually, these, these uh, things kind of contract as well. This distance here is actually gets smaller, and this distance, just like this length contraction happens. But we're generally not concerned with that that variable and how it contracts uh, whatever where its nowness con uh, intersects with our here-ness. 